Hi everyone, uh, my name is Maddie or Madeline and I'll be going through the seventh lecture on law and order. Just to give you a general overview of what we'll be going through, I'll first be talking about a little bit generally what law and order debates are and how they fit in the context of the other kinds of debates that we've been talking about. And then the second to fourth elements are kind of breaking down some of the key elements of debating within that specific context. So first, talking about the specifics of principles of regulation, then looking a little bit at the mechanisms which might be specific to law and order debates, and thirdly, kind of talking about some of the general harms or, and particularly macro level harms that you might see or, or should look for if you have unusual law and order topics that you're not sure how to approach. And then the final thing will just be kind of wrapping up and making a few additional comments. So when we look generally at law and order debates, it's important to consider the role of law within debating generally, which is that the legal system of a state is the way in which governments seek to regulate behaviour. And this is both through incentivising certain patterns of behaviour and more commonly, in particular within law and order debates, through deterring certain patterns of behaviour. Uh, in a way, most policy debates, and by that I mean, of course, debates which contain the word should or which contain a call to action by which governments implement laws generally, which may be debates about regulation or debates about social movements or debates generally in which the government changes any law at all, are similar thematically to law and order debates insofar as the silent actor of a should debate is always the state or is almost always the state. Uh, however, the way we assess the debate is a little bit different and the kind of salience of those themes are a bit different. But in general, the way we assess laws is whether they are more good or more bad in their impact on a society. Law and, aided, law and order debates are just a more explicit form of policy debates. Um, this, this means that you'll notice a lot of the similar themes and structures from previous lectures coming through, but they just might come through a bit more explicitly. So where the actor of the state is silent in other debates, it's far more explicit here. The nature of the government and the arms of enforcement, for example, the, the arms of the state through the police or through the military or through the judiciary or through the legislature become much more explicit, which means there's more scope in law and order debates to characterize the state and in particular the way that state acts within the specific context of that country or within that sphere of the world if the debate is contained in that particular way. Um, secondly, the way that you regulate behaviour is more direct. So a, a normal form of regulation in a should debate might be, you know, um, a market mechanism or a kind of normative effect. Ordinarily, law and order debates are far more express. So things like criminalization is the most coercive form of mechanism form of mechanism that the government has available to them. It's the way in which they can deprive individuals of liberty or in certain contexts of life. And in that sense, the degree of harm that you're assessing in law and order debates is ordinarily a little bit higher, or at least principally, the coerciveness of that degree is higher um, because the ways in which governments are interfering with your lives tend to be more extreme. And thirdly, in law and order debates, there is normally a more normative element that you may not see in other types of policy debates. And that's because the legal system is as close as the state comes to codifying a set of morality. Obviously, there's a separation in some extent to the morals of a state and the laws of a state. But if there were a Venn diagram of morality and law, there would certainly be a stark overlap, particularly in the realm of criminalization. And that means that there's often room for principle arguments in law and order topics where they may only sometimes be room for principled arguments in other forms of topics. Obviously, there's already been a lecture on principles, so I won't be going over those same structures, but I will talk a little bit uh, later about some of the kinds of principles that you might talk to or the ways in which principles from a state are relevant. Uh, most law and order topics have the same key questions. And when I say this, of course, you know, the similar thing with all debating structures is 
there will always be an exception to every rule and the structure is a pro forma, not a rule. Uh, it's just a way to consider debates. So if there are other arguments or other themes or other specific contexts, those are the ones which you should turn to. It's just a way to approach topics that you feel uncomfortable or unfamiliar with or a way to kind of learn the area as opposed to a hard and fast mandate for the ways that you must approach a law and order topic. But a way that you can think about law and order topics is by firstly asking the question, is the behavior something which we should regulate? And this has two elements. The first being that is the behavior undesirable in some way? or desirable, conversely. And secondly, that the question arises of whether it is regulatable by the state. So even if it is desirable or undesirable, is it something the government should intervene in? And that's often where the principled question arises. Um, you can think of this in general form of debating as answering the question, is there a problem or is there a need for change, which can apply to most kinds of topics. And the second question that you might have within a law and order topic is will the specific form of regulation change behavior and this is essentially an assessment of the model or the policy uh, at addressing this problem or at addressing this need for change and the third kind of question is how will the regulation affect people broadly the reason i'm using the word regulation is because law and order topics canvas both criminal and civil jurisdictions so they may not always be things such as criminalization, but they may be, you know, the promotion of certain civil regimes. I'll talk a little bit about that distinction later, but that's all I mean when I say regulation. I don't mean to say that law and order is always specifically the word regulate. So the way that this presentation will continue is to break down those three questions. So turning first to the question of, is the behavior something that should be regulated in this way? And by this, the two sub questions that we were talking about earlier, but essentially this is, is there a need for change? And is that change within the scope of the government's mandate? So the first part of this is, is the behavior wrong or undesirable? Um, this is normally, and I make this statement a bit cautiously, not the salient part of law and order debates often the way that law and order debates will operate is that there is a clear harm or clear benefit in society based upon a form of behavior. And the real clashes are about the government's role or about the mechanisms of enforcing that form of behavior. But I thought it would be reticent to not include this as a sub question because there are sometimes topics which raise this issue. So if you distinguish between the two topics on the screen, uh, we can see from the second one that there is probably scope to argue that religious indoctrination is not harmful or that there is a characterization of religious indoctrination which is in fact good. Um, so keep that in mind when you have law and order debates. On Conversely, the topic on the left is likely one in which we recognize a society, a form of harm uh, being terrorism and the real clash is whether this is an acceptable form of intervention by the state. So in general, when we characterize harm, uh, make sure that you look, so the important thing to recognize here is that because the government is implementing a law, the harm must be entire. So it's not enough to say that something is sometimes harmful or in some ways harmful, or but when exercised by certain people harmful, unless you can attach your mechanism to that specific scope of influence. When you're talking about law and order topics, the harm has to be one that is endemic to the behavior itself. We don't criminalize behavior that is sometimes bad. We criminalize behavior that is inherently bad. So where there are questions that arise as to whether a behavior is harmful, make sure that you look to and utilize the inherent features of that behavior. Um, the second thing to identify here is then because of that, you have scope and fiat power, particularly on government teams, to clearly distinguish what is within and outside that criminal form of behavior. So to look to the example of religious indoctrination, you may be very clear to distinguish between, you know, a faith-based household and a form of indoctrination which is coercive or involves force or violence. 
to make clear that the kinds of behavior that you are capturing are those which have harm attached to it and the kinds of behavior which you are not capturing are those which are less likely or only sometimes harmful does that make sense um and this is something you should also do in general in, do in debating because you should be clear in delineating which parts of the debate you want to regulate and which you don't but it's particularly important in law debates for the reason of the inherency of the behavior and the fact that every single person is affected by the law so therefore every single person must be affected by the harm or that that harm must be in in innate within this form of behavior that you're regulating the other thing you can do other than expressly fiat out and by that i mean kind of model out the forms of good behavior so the forms of good religion or the forms of good religious upbringing is to make explicit weighing so even if you can so you might say from this we exclude faith-based upbringings or families where they pray um, but even if the other team disagrees with that definition or that characterization, there are other reasons why those forms of religious indoctrination wouldn't be captured. And those reasons might be, and this would just depend upon the debate, ones of capacity. So the legal system is resource finite, it is not infinite, and it is in the incentives of the government and also in the police force to capture the most clear violations of those laws for the reason of maximizing their resource usage um, and that's because those are the ones that are easiest to prove and also the ones that cause the most harm within society there may be incentive reasons why the most minor form of wrong won't be captured so that you are least likely to pursue a suit against your parents if there are small harms and that's because the costs of litigation are so high and the reward that you would receive in the form of damages is likely to be low if there is not very much harm attached to the behavior or there may simply be procedural reasons for example that the less clear behavior is bad the less clear it will be to a judge or within a courtroom or by the police or upon the evidence on the face of it and the final thing you can say is that even if none of those reasons apply it's important within or it's often useful within law debates to consider the role of discretion and that discretion operates entirely up the chain so it, it operates at the point of the individuals it operates at the points of the enforcers being the police or the prosecution department it operates at the point of legal advice and legal representation and it operates at the point of the judiciary and the judge and the jury um, a judge may give a particularly lenient sentence if something managed to get through the entire way that really wasn't very harmful. Um, for example, they can provide things like a suspended sentence, which means that you live your life essentially the same except with a conviction recorded or with a temporary conviction that goes away if you comply with irrelevant conditions. Um, so make sure that you can avoid those kind of outliers uh, when you set up the scope of the debate, because that's kind of the only place that this is particularly relevant, uh, especially in most debates. But you want to make sure that the issue of whether the behavior is harmful doesn't become an issue, which is one of the reasons these are useful strategies on the government teams to kind of make sure that the debate does turn on the questions of mechanisms or on the question of principles, as opposed to a question of definitional uncertainty. The second and kind of more pertinent element to this question is the one that turns upon even if the behavior is bad or is undesirable, is it one that the state should interfere with? So these two topics uh, both have kind of principled clashes as to the role of the state. And the role of the state is something that is explored often expressly within law and order debates. So the topic about criminalization of adultery, you probably can accept that adultery is harmful, that it makes people sad and that it breaks down marriages. 
but there is certainly a question of whether the state has any right, or whether it is desirable for the state to interfere with the personal familial lives of individuals or to imply some kind of contractual relationship between adults that are married, such that a violation of it in the form of adultery attracts criminal sanction. Uh, and the question there is how broad should the state's power be? How high does the harm upon an individual need to be before the state intervenes? Why does adultery meet the threshold of other forms of crimes? Um, because as you know from the principal discussion, analogies are often particularly useful when making principled arguments. Conversely, the topic on the right talks about whether the state's role is to be present within Indigenous communities that it may have been complicit in the suffering of, or certainly was complicit in the suffering of, and whether it had the right to opt out of that responsibility, or whether indeed opting out of that responsibility is something it had an obligation to do because of the fact it had previously over prosecuted those communities or was so bad at exercising that power. That clash is probably more balanced than the clash as to adultery, uh, which probably falls against the team, which suggests adultery is within the realm of the state. However, they're very context specific questions, obviously, because they turn very specifically upon the relationship the state has within those worlds. So if it is a state which is based very expressly upon, uh, you know, familial values or upon the functioning marriages of its citizens, then the criminalization of adultery might be something which is acceptable. Whereas if the state is one which has treated its indigenous communities with nothing but respect and um, polices them politely and well, then it would be harder to prove that, that indigenous communities should have autonomy in those decision-making processes. Um, when we have to justify the form of government intervention or that the government has the right to intervene within a specific sphere of society. So in those examples, the sphere of Indigenous communities or the sphere of family. It's important to look to a couple of things to try and justify that intervention. So the first one that you can look to is the complicity of the state in the problem. Uh, so for example, the fact that the state is like partially responsible for the over or you know is responsible in its current or historic form for the over policing of Indigenous communities and the fact that there is such endemic crime rates within those communities, often within specific contexts. You can impact the nature of the harm. If harm is large or destructive enough, even if it is one that is ordinarily outside of the state's ambit, it is something the state can intervene in. A useful analogy here for the would be something like domestic violence or neglect of children. The state does intervene within families at the highest point of harm, particularly to vulnerable actors. So if an analogy can be drawn there, that would support an intervention within the family or world. The third one might be the existence of obligations. Uh, the role of the state is something which is uncertain uh, insofar as it's contested, but it seems likely that the state has a number of base obligations to its people. Um, you know, things like providing shelter or making sure that uh, people have access to water are things that would be simple. Things like protecting individuals or ensuring order or ensuring equality might be more amorphous ideals, but there are certainly reasons to believe that they do have those obligations. For example, you could argue that the government has an obligation to uh, to enact law equally amongst its citizens rather than uh, unequally. Of course, when we're talking about principles, we have to make sure they're not contingent and then that there is equality symmetrically, but that's in the principled lecture. If you can look to a legitimate purpose of intervention other than of expanding state power, that is often persuasive. Or if there is no other actor that can intervene because of a particular vulnerability or because of resource capacity, then that might be a good reason for state intervention. So some examples would be uh, in terms of capacity, the topic that this house would make crimes against the environment, crimes of universal jurisdiction. It might be argued that without vesting universal jurisdiction, particularly in states with greater access to the powers of prosecution, those crimes would go unpunished. Um, 
an argument about state complicity might be one, a topic rather, might be one as to the, this house compensating individuals found innocent of crimes. Um, and you could look to the fact that in some ways the state has directly stolen from those individuals, be it in terms of money or in terms of years or in terms of reputation. And, uh, and when we look to analogies, those analogies are often made explicit within the topic. So for example, a topic that was like, this house supports poverty as a defense to crimes of acquisition would ask for analogies as to what kinds of defenses we ordinarily allow. Similarly, crimes of criminalized, you know, policies of criminalization, look to analogies of what kinds of behavior do we criminalize? Um, that's the example on the screen, which is which kinds of behavior or at what point is there a legitimate purpose for criminalization, um, which is a theme that you should probably know if I'm doing this. The first one is incapacitation. So that would be removing an individual from society if the harm that they pose is too great. Uh, the most extreme form of incapacitation is obviously the death penalty. They can no longer harm people if they are dead. The second is general deterrence, which is the more, the more ordinary form of deterrence, which means uh, motivating individuals to not take a certain behavior or skewing their risk calculus such that they are deterred or prevented or persuaded against a form of behavior. A good example of this is a particularly harsh form of punishment. So you could equally argue that the death penalty has a deterrent role because the punishment exceeds any benefit of a crime. People are less likely to opt into that crime. Specific deterrence is one which targets individuals or communities. Retribution is the purpose of punishment, which you can consider the purpose of the victim. So it's the it's the way in which we give victims their say or the purpose which recognizes that victims have some rights within the justice system. Uh, so making sure that they get to see someone be punished. So that might be one reason why a criminal record exists, even where no other penalty is is attached. For example, where there's a suspended sentence, is to make sure that the victim has some sense of justice or some sense of compensation from the state. And the final one is rehabilitation. So forms of punishment which prioritize making sure the offender is protected and recognize that vulnerability of criminals, uh, particularly for a certain category of crimes. So that's kind of the first or preliminary question, the need for change. The second one is whether that change will effectively be addressed or whether that behavior will be regulated effectively. Um, this is really a question of mechanisms and within law and order, there are a lot of moving parts and that's because the legal system in states is one that is very complex for the reason of protecting individuals that move through it and also for the reason of separating power at a government level. So there's obviously the individual level, the, the person that ordinarily commits that behavior, have we changed their likelihood to commit it? That is firstly a question of characterizing their incentives and their incentive structures. And secondly, uh, or in the alternative, a way of looking at their capacity, their resources, or, or their actual ability to commit the crime. Uh, the second one is the arms of government which enforce the the crime is caught or that the behavior is found. Uh, so the easiest example of this is the police and making sure that well and the question is whether they have increased powers that mean that they are better able to enforce those crimes noting that there is often a category of behavior which um, is not deterred but is not caught at the police level, either because of police discretion being poorly applied or because of the inability to do certain things like the inability to enter houses or the inability uh, to override a victim's uh, re refusal to participate within proceedings, etc. But the other way that you might catch someone is actually the reporting by the victim. So that's another mechanism that you should consider. Does this change the calculus of individuals who would otherwise stay quiet? Uh, then at the point that there is some behavior, so using crime, I guess, specifically, um, that there is some crime that has been alleged and bundled together to now progress into the legal system, being the juries and judges and courtrooms of a state, 
looking at those mechanisms and those mechanisms turn a little bit upon the jurisdiction that you're in but you might look at things like the legal representation that an individual has the ways that those actors juries judges courts uh, have greater or fewer powers to intervene and the amount and quality of evidence and you might also look at the ways in which they can now sentence people differently etc and the final thing might be even if those formal mechanisms uh, don't provide much help in terms of mechanizing the policy that there are often and particularly in law debates uh, non-formal mechanisms of enforcing justice and that's because the legal system is one that is largely normative and is enforced largely by consent um, or express coercion and you might look to things like media scrutiny or the changing stigmatization or norms that are attached because of a certain policy these are all just examples of places where you can tie the policy to the outcome that you want um, so if you're really stuck normally one of these will work <laughs> at least but often multiple of them will and it's worth considering structurally how at every stage of the process a certain policy will affect an individual so uh, for example if there was a criminalization of a particular act that's likely to firstly deter individuals so let's say criminalization of adultery, that is likely to be an additional deterrent upon the act of adultery because individuals are less likely to seek adultery if the risk of prison is attached and that changes their risk reward calculus. It increases the powers of the police or the powers of formal bodies of enforcement to the extent that they would previously have had no power of enforcement. It also increases the ability of victims to speak up and collectivize. Uh, it also increases the ability to prosecute or conversely to find a uh, civil benefit where you're negotiating for divorce. You can seek better remedies there because you have this form of leveraging and bargaining power over your partner. And it significantly changes the norms attached to adultery, which means that there is a likely more coercive stigma around staying within relationships. And you can kind of step through those mechanisms more broadly. But when we're talking about mechanisms, it is very context specific. So a few kind of things to know about the legal system. The first one is to notice the distinction between civil and criminal systems. Now, different states have quite distinct modes of prosecution within these, but within your specific context, note that there's often a higher burden and standard of proof within the criminal system than the civil system. This means that it is harder to make someone a criminal than it is to make them give you money. And that's obviously for the reason that in most states, the idea of depriving someone of liberty is more important than the idea of depriving someone of a sum of money. The second thing is access to legal representation. Uh, often within criminal matters, victims are not represented. Instead, the state is represented and the defendant and the victim acts or speaks through nominally the state, but otherwise has little decision making impact upon the forms of legal strategy. And conversely, the defendant is rarely, um, it is more likely to have state provided legal representation in criminal proceedings and then in civil ones, where most of the time people have to obtain their own private representation, although also note the existence of legal representation uh, charities and bodies which seek to represent the poorest individuals, and there are often equivalents around the world. The police only really tend to matter within criminal jurisdictions, and the availability of remedies it just is quite distinct. So things like imprisonment, or a criminal record or a conviction or community service are penalties that are, can only be attached to criminal jurisdictions, whereas damages and the payment of money or the enforcement of contractual promises tends to be the remedies that are available within civil jurisdictions. There are also different actors within those worlds, aside from police, for example, the role of juries. So a good example is this topic, which is essentially asking the debate to consider um, the distinction between civil and criminal jurisdictions for workplace discrimination and what would be ideal firstly for individuals and secondly for society and there's a stopgap question in this topic which is uh, is that ideal actually reached because perhaps it would be ideal if workplace discrimination were criminalized 
but uh, exclusively, but can the government team prove that they will now all be criminalized or will there instead be just a gap of individuals that no longer pursue justice in any form. And it looks to the questions of how these different systems affect individual incentives, but also corporate incentives, and then the question of societal impact and harm. Uh, so for example, an individual may be less likely to seek criminal recourse because it is more public, uh, because it is less within their control, uh, because it is harder and less likely that they will have access to those remedies um, as opposed to a civil remedy. Uh, conversely, if there is no civil remedy, they may be more likely to seek criminal remedies than nothing because there is still a chance, because there is likely to be more legal representation which seeks to support them, because there is often scope for class actions, and because they are not the ones that have to fund those proceedings, whereas they do have to fund civil proceedings or uh, civil settlements to the extent they need their own private lawyers. So looking at those different mechanisms and the ways they affect individuals' incentives. Another legal context that's worth recognizing within the context of law and order topics is international law. There are a, a genre of law and order topics uh, which are about international law and often but not always those topics recognize that the enforcement is almost nothing and that's for the reason that within international law which regulates states as opposed to individuals with very few exceptions uh, it regulates by consent. So states need to opt in to the jurisdiction of the Rome Statute to be bound by the International Criminal Court, and they have to opt in to the International Court of Justice in order to be bound by the decisions there. They can make reservations as to the particular subject matter that they are bound by, and they can refuse to participate for example, by refusing to allow um, the investigating bodies to enter the particular territories or to provide them with the evidence they need to prosecute those cases. And that is even then only if they are bound by the laws themselves, which states have to opt into in order to be bound by, with again, almost no exceptions. So when you have a topic about international law, often the question of enforcement is more marginal because it is harder to prove a high margin enforceability. And the question is usually a trade off as to the small diminishing or small increase of enforcement as opposed to a large normative impact and the ways that we should weigh those things up. Uh, so for example, this topic as to domestic courts trying foreign nationals committing war crimes abroad, this might uh, increase the enforceability mechanism of international law, but it may also have a normative harm, which is that states are less likely to opt into war crime charters, or that foreign nationals or that foreign states from which those foreign nationals arise are less likely to regard these as legitimate prosecutions. And the question then of whether that is doing justice for the victims of those war crimes. Uh, so these have been kind of discussions of the mechanisms of enforcement structurally, but we also have to consider our context in terms of the incentive structures of the individuals that we're trying to affect, because obviously that's the first in the chain reaction that the, the first way that we can try and regulate behavior is by trying to regulate the behavior of an individual. So when we're doing this, be specific about the types of individuals that you're looking at, uh, which will differ very distinctly between law and order topics, which types of people are most likely to be prosecuted or sued for types of behavior. And those are individuals uh, within law and order that are often vulnerable ones as opposed to malicious ones, um, which may be the answer to the next question, why they are overrepresented. Things like over policing, over sentencing, uh, endemic structural problems, which make them more likely to turn to crime, et cetera. And then also always identify the motivation for the specific form of behavior, because without identifying the motivation, it is difficult to identify how that motivation changes or swings now that a certain policy has been enacted. Consider their appetite for law breaking. That's because when governments regulate behavior through laws, they change the risk reward calculus to the extent they increase the risks. However, you have to argue that those risks 
are, are the margin between behavior that individual is willing to do versus that an individual is unwilling to do, whereas perhaps the increase of risk still falls within their acceptable risk appetite. And then why this particular policy is unique. Often law and order topics are just harshening or, or just harsher penalties attached to behaviour that is already deemed unacceptable. Why is that harshness the one that is likely to affect individuals specifically? Um, just in terms of characterising vulnerable actors, this topic, which obviously raises question, is, is kind of a very simple example, um, which is that the, you know, like police have the right to intervene and drug test within high schools now. You might consider the types of individuals that are most likely firstly to be using drugs, but secondly, the types of individuals that the police are most likely to prosecute from successful drug tests, because those may not always be the same. There may be a similar disproportion of individuals across demographics who uh, are drug tested positively, although that may not also be true. Um, but even if that were true, it is likely that poorer individuals or individuals with more structural barriers to access legal representation or to access connections are the ones that are most likely to be prosecuted. But consider things like which types of individuals the police are likely to drug test, which types of individuals are likely to have the systemic or structural reasons for taking drugs or needing to deal or test drugs uh, in order to make money, and which types of individuals are the ones that are least likely to be persuaded by the presence of police at their school. Okay, that's mechanisms. The third thing we have to look at is the kind of macro level harms and the consequences of legal change. Uh, within law and order topics, the harm is also entire and or the impact is entire because it is a change in the kind of fabric of the society or the normative way in which governments regulate their individuals, the messages they're sending and the ways that the arms of government act and enforce certain things. So the harms are quite large and you should always make sure to impact them for that reason. I'm just going to look through a couple of examples of quite common harms uh, and in, so that you can look at these when you're going through um, your topics or any law and order topics that you have. It's just important to recognise that even if the government team is able to establish that there is an, a problem within society and that that problem, that problem will be addressed effectively, if you can point to a kind of broader societal consequence that is more important than that problem, you will still be able to win the debate equally if you're able to point to a way in which the achievement of that outcome also harms the most vulnerable individuals in a way that is unacceptable, you'll be able to win the debate. So this is often a way in which uh, opposition teams are able to address the kind of questions of the debate. And it is essentially what are the harms of increased powers of enforcement? And that looks often at the kinds of powers of enforcement. So the, the nature of the state, the nature of the police, the nature of the mechanisms uh, of power that a state has entrenched, and whether it is desirable for the state to have more power over private individuals within the specific way. So uh, a common theme that you will have noticed in a lot of topics, but that arises very explicitly within law and order topics, is that of vulnerable actors. Uh, we know within law and order that the types of individuals that are most likely to be over policed are vulnerable, the types of individuals that are most likely to be unable to access legal representation or most likely to accept plea bargains or most likely to be over sentenced are vulnerable communities. We know that those consequences are endemic as opposed to isolated to the extent they affect communities broadly and we know that those are also the types of communities that are least able to access justice in other forms, uh, either formally because of the lack of access to capital that allows them to challenge the judicial system, or informally because the lack of access to representation which allows them to change norms around them. So it is often worthwhile considering the ways in which a law will interact with those structures which by which the law tends to uh, entrench the oppression of certain communities. So a, a good example of this, I think, is actually the third one, uh, which, and this is, and this question of oppressed communities is particularly good or important if the, uh, the government teams are purporting to assist with vulnerability. Obviously, 
that's generally true outside of law and order topics as well. But for example, in the topic as to supporting poverty as a defense to crimes of acquisition, which I mentioned earlier, you may consider the ways in which individuals who steal are most, which communities they are most likely to steal from uh, and that how that may actually make particularly poor communities even less safe or even less stable within the structure of their society. Uh, so for example, you can argue that whilst it would be the most profitable thing to steal from a high socioeconomic person, most crimes of acquisition are, are petty crimes within poor communities that are not able to protect themselves. And the fact that you deny those individuals a right of recourse is particularly harmful because it incentivizes theft within those communities more than any other. Another common uh, harm that you see within law and order topics is the characterization of the state as evil. And obviously it doesn't necessarily have to be evil, but certainly as oppressive or as one which has bad or malicious intent in some way. So for example, in the first topic, um, if you argue that certain states now have the incentive to characterize groups of rebellious individuals or legitimate protests or legitimate freedom fighters as terrorists in order to openly torture them and deter future terrorism within their state, you are likely to be able to impact a pretty substantial harm as to dissent within undemocratic or states or within autocratic states. Um, Equally, you might want to consider what the state's incentives are for passing this particular law and in which context they are likely to exercise this power. Um, the converse of that may be that evil states will now be more transparent in their evilness. Um, you argue that they are torturing individuals on either side, but at least now there is some marginal benefit of regulating that torture in a way that is beneficial and minimizes harm within a sphere of influence that is already harmed. Um, but consider when you're doing this, characterizing the particular state, characterizing the particular context and looking to their incentive structures as well, um, maintaining order at what cost. Uh, a similar but not the same argument is individuals or actors that do not want harsher penalties to attach to them. And this is often a question of powerful actors that seek to avoid enforcement. So for example, consider the way that corporations would act if out of court settlements for workplace discrimination were banned would they uh, prefer to go to court or prefer to suppress the victim reporting individuals to criminal regimes? How would they suppress those individuals? Um, consider the ways that companies that want to pollute will react to crimes against the environment having universal jurisdiction or the way that states that benefit from those crimes would want to react. And this is essentially looking at the ways that structures of power can override the legal system. When we're talking about um, harms of unenforceability, make sure that those are not, that the harm is not the unenforceability, that the harm is something more than the unenforceability. So for example, that the harm is the suppression of victims' voices, that the harm is that you privately shame and make victims feel even guiltier about reporting, et cetera. Um, and the final one we'll look at is normative consequences, uh, a theme that you would have identified in this lecture is that the legal system is often the way in which norms are communicated from the government to society. So consider, so whilst normative arguments may not always be the most persuasive, they are more likely to be persuasive within a law and order topic. Uh, so consider the way in which governments message their populaces when they implement certain laws. Do they produce stigmas? Do they normalize certain behavior? Do they uh, recognize certain wrongs and compensate individuals in that sense? Do they instead act to coerce individuals into feelings of shame and, and consider uh, the legitimacy that is attached to those decision making? For example, if you lower the burden of proof, on the one hand, that's the state recognizing a particular form of wrong, which may increase societal recognition uh, that that behavior is particularly pernicious, but conversely, it may be one which treats those prosecutions as illegitimate and therefore makes people 
uh, think less severely of individuals with with who are convicted of those crimes. So make sure there's a balancing act there as well. Uh, the final thing I'll just kind of wrap up with a couple of comments. Uh, the first one is to just kind of draw out the salient themes that I've talked about in this lecture. Firstly, that uh, within law and order topics, there are, are there is scope for discussing in an explicit way morals and principles in a way that often is not available as commonly within other forms of debates. So look to the key themes which states treat as inalienable, things like presumption of innocence, things like justice, and consider using those principles either in denying that the state should interfere within a particular realm or denying that a particular policy is beneficial. Look to the specific contexts of those state and the forms of morality that are relevant there. And, and conversely, the incentive structures of the state to regulate morality within those, within those worlds. In which ways do they seek to regulate morality? Is that morality one which uh, is singular or in a sense that it uh, isolates particular groups of individuals? And look to the degree of consent that individuals have. Uh, will individuals accept this form of intervention? And if not, how will that affect that regulation upon them and upon society more broadly? Uh, secondly, the role of the, the state and the role of the law is overwhelmingly to protect individuals from undesirable behavior. So make sure that you impact things like vulnerability. When we're talking about undesirability, make sure to characterize the context both of the particular state, but also of the particular legal system, and also be creative with harms. There's lots of moving pieces throughout the legal system, as you would have noticed, and there's often a lot of ways in which at each point in time, a harm can attach to a mechanism. So if you're really stuck, just go through that process. And, and finally, as you will have noticed, the law is a balancing act between uh, you know, private rights and public interest, between increased enforcement and protecting the most vulnerable. Um, so recognize that when you're writing your cases and be preemptive with trade-offs as you go through. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the comments. Otherwise, good luck.